Uh, let me introduce Randy just briefly to all of you. Randy is the executive director of the Foundation Earth, uh, which is a nonprofit organization and a think tank that is developing big, a big picture for human order a new order that is all about working within the planet's life support system. Uh, Randy is also the co-founder of the environmental organization Rainforest Action Network. Uh, protecting forests and challenging corporate power has been the key focus of this network since its foundation in as early as 1985. Uh, yeah, 85. Um, Randy is a- or was, or was that 1885? <laughs> I, I, I guess with 19, I'm, I'm correct. <laughs> um, he is a former filmmaker and a veteran of many high visibility corporate accountability campaigns and has advocated for the rights of indigenous peoples for many years. Um, he served seven years as president of the City of San Francisco Commission on the Environment and is also a special advisor to the World Future uh, Council. Uh, his academic background is uh, he holds a master degree in environmental planning and in, nine, in 2018 he was also awarded a doctorate from the San Francisco State University. He received numerous awards and Wikipedia officially documents uh, his, his nickname which is Hurricane. <laughs> so, uh, but he told us earlier that's, that's because of his uh, dancing skills and not linked to the climate crisis. But another description, which I like very much, comes from the Wall Street Journal, who called uh, Randy once an environmental pit bull. So this is very promising. Thank you so much, Randy, for getting up as early as 7 a.m. for us today. And you're most welcome in our Zoom session. How are you this morning, Randy? Actually, uh, quite good. Well rested. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for making this possible. The title that we chose for today's session is Corona climate election from crisis to a Green New Deal. Uh, we want to talk with uh, you, Randy, today about your ideas and concepts for this new human order that you develop at the Foundation Earth. But uh, we would also like to take this opportunity to get some first-hand impressions from the actual political situation in the, in the US right now. We are sure you're also a political observer and um, yeah, for us, it's a really nice opportunity to get some of these firsthand impressions. So the session today is organized as an interactive interview uh, with Randy. Usually we had uh, talks for one hour and then a Q&A session. This will be different today. Uh, we prepared an interview with different topics. And then in between each topic, there will be lots of uh, space and time for you, the participants, to pose questions to Randy, to make your comments about the ideas that uh, Randy presents. So we all invite you already uh, to be prepared for a little bit more interactive uh, lecture today. Before we talk extensively about the ideas for the climate, etc., cetera, um, Randy, allow us to start with getting an impression about the corona situation in your country. Since yesterday, Germany is under very strict lockdown rules. Public and economic life is shut down. How is the situation in Washington, D.C. and in your country in general? Like many countries around the world, we're polarized in kind of what gets described as political factions, but it's certainly polarized. And the uh, Thanksgiving holiday that we have here uh, had a lot of family gatherings, and maybe there were half as many as there typically are, but there were still so many that were having another spike. And because of the, uh, the Christmas holiday and, and Hanukkah season coming up and family gatherings, uh, that's quite likely to happen again. So it's not a pretty picture. It's horrifying to think of 3,000 people dying in every, every 24 hours yeah. just in the United States. So um, uh, it's a scary situation. Um, I like to sort of stretch backward in time and say, okay, why are we having these virus outbreaks? You know, um, yeah. is, the, is the dynamic really any different than say the 1800s from earlier pandemics, you know, or, or plagues? And, you know, it does of course have something to do with uh, humanity's uh, um, interaction with the natural world. Mm -hmm. Right. In the case of uh, this particular coronavirus and and um, <clears throat> uh, bats and pangolin animals as a possible source of the virus, 
uh, that interaction says says something about uh, why this happened in the first place uh, and indicates that it's likely to happen again and perhaps even at a, at a greater scale of damage. Um, uh, we hear a lot of, of, of political rhetoric uh, in the United States about Donald Trump and, uh, and having mishandled this. And I think it's, it's accurate if I try to be objective, which yeah. is difficult with this particular person. Uh, but if one tries to be objective, I would say that he did not tend to surround himself with the the, uh, the kind of experts. Or if they were, uh, in the case of the person Anthony Fauci, whose name most people will know, um, he didn't uh, always listen to him or or follow that advice. And so, yeah, I think a lot of the blame can be put on the Trump administration, and in particular, the the man at the top. So uh, one might ask, is it going to change much in terms of the Biden administration? Well, we still have to get to January 20th in the inauguration and have it happen without you know, uh, a military coup or something hideous. But it, it does look as if the stability of the United States and our institutions will hold up. All right. Yeah. Uh, I remain a, a little bit nervous, uh, but uh, as people may have heard, uh, the Electoral College system of the United States officially certified all 50 states and the, and the Electoral College, and, and Biden was you know, declared the winner from that perspective. Uh, but uh, you can't underestimate uh, this man's desire for power. And, uh, uh, but uh, the head of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is a name that many of you will also know, uh, has finally come around to say that uh, he's expecting a Biden administration. It's also, I think, pretty clear that the senior generals in the U.S. military uh, uh, have have an, an hold to some decent principles. And so, um, though it's a tenuous situation, uh, I think we'll get through it. And the Biden yeah. administration is surrounding themselves with quite a few uh, uh, top quality people. And I think the Biden leadership will follow a lot of that advice. The question will be how much will the bifurcated Americans uh, you know, adhere to his request, say for 100 days of wearing a mask, which mm -hmm. will be his big announcement at the beginning. And does he have any means um, to influence the policies at the moment? Or is this all uh, just he has to wait until January 20? No, he has to wait until January 20. Uh, but um, I mean, one thing that that um, is, of course, just rolling out here in the United States, I think this is day three of vaccinations uh, across the country. And, and uh, the Trump administration has pushed hard for a vaccine to be developed and made monies available and worked with companies uh, even outside the United States, as people know. And, and so... Um, uh, but a vaccination is not a, a silver bullet solution in the short term. However, yeah. it's an important component. And so rolling that out successfully, um, uh, a military logistics person was put in charge of that, and they do know how to do logistics. Uh, and so uh, I think that that's likely to go well. What we still don't know is, is uh, you know, will there be very many episodes of scary side effects. We've had our first one in Alaska, where a person who was not given to uh, allergies or allergic reactions had a quite severe allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. Well, that, you know, that becomes national news yesterday and today, no doubt again, uh, and, and keeps that subset of America, which might be as high as, you know, 30% uh, that doesn't want to get vaccinated, keeps them at bay. So that's where we stand at the moment. And uh, yeah, that's it's interesting. I mean, from here, from Germany, one could get the impression that Trump's final steps are just pushing forward the execution uh, of black prisoners, granting pardons for his allies and, and playing golf. So um, apart from this vaccination campaign, which I guess is, is not really like pushed forward in the, in the management sense from his administration, is there any agenda for bringing the corona crisis a little bit more under control under January 20? Or what do you know from Trump's 
uh, policies for these there, last weeks? There's pretty much no agenda except for the vaccine rollout. Mm -hmm. And he wants that to be his big success story. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, to some extent, fair enough. Uh, they've, they've done well at fostering it at this point. Uh, yeah. But all of the other things in terms of distancing and mask wearing and, and how to handle uh, when an area of the country should be locked down and when it can be opened up and at what level, uh, there's no real plan for that at, the, at this point. The states are doing it differently, of course. Initially, it was kind of the, the coastal areas, which tend to be more uh, uh, politically liberal uh, in the middle of the country, which is more politically conservative and more rural. Uh, uh, but now it's hit so hard in places like North and South Dakota and farming areas like Nebraska yeah. uh, that, um, um, you know, they're in trouble. Yeah. You already mentioned your prediction is that it will remain stable and there is a, a, a good probability that Joe Biden can uh, can get into office without uh, any further, um, let's say, chaos. But do you think Trump, will he finally recognize the election results? When would he do that? Or what are the, what is the alternative for him not to do it? How will he leave the White House if he doesn't? Uh, no one really knows. There are all kinds of videos going around. Maybe perhaps, uh, you know, some of them have uh, hit Germany as well. But the one that I saw yesterday was a moving a moving store, a furniture moving crew uh, pushing him in his desk from the Oval Office uh, with him still sitting behind it, out of the office, down the hall, the, the lift on the back of the truck comes up and they, they, push, they push him into the truck and the desk back into the White House. Uh, so uh, odds are that he's got such a bad attitude that, that he will... Uh, I, I don't believe he'll likely show up for the inauguration on the 20th. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's happened before in U.S. history, but rarely. But so I think he'll fight to the bitter end. He's, he's raised a, a hideous amount of money on this, uh, which he can, has the reins to use, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, which he has the reins to use however he wants over the subsequent years. Yeah. You know, and you're right about the, you know, the final behaviors and the pardons. He may pardon himself and his children, you know, and his lawyer, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani and people like that. I think that's uh, pretty well to be expected. Uh, and we'll find out in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, so still it's it's very exciting to see what will happen. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, another point about the Biden administration, though, is, is that um, and we'll get into this more in, in the course of the rest of the discussion. Uh, but um, um, I see the Democrats as a lesser of two evils from an ecological perspective yeah. and not uh, not the great paradigm shift to a more socially just and ecologically sound world. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. And, and the Republican Party has become less environmentally concerned than, say, 30 years ago when I used to sit in Washington, D.C., even though I was based in California at the time. There was a, a Republican congressman uh, who um, his wife was an anthropologist, and, and she basically, I think, gave him uh, marching orders to help save the rainforest uh, and support the rights of indigenous peoples. And he and I would sit with our feet up on his desk and do radio interviews across the country together, you know, uh, yeah. but that, that doesn't happen anymore. So mm -hmm. the, uh, it's, it's, we're ecologically minded people are happy to see the Biden administration come in, uh, but know that that is uh, not likely to be the level of change that we need. Mm -hmm. So as a final point there on that, uh, perhaps four years from now, we can set the context and the extreme weather events may have scared people enough to want to see bigger changes. Mm -hmm. But in, in related to this, how harmful would you um, 
would you evaluate the, the four years of the Trump administration for the climate poli policies and politics in general? If you say there, I mean, with the Biden administration, it's not yeah. a big game changer, but yeah. um, from what we all know about Trump, how harmful was it? Well, if you back up to the eight years of the Obama administration, two terms, um, Obama had to do a lot of things through executive order, including effectively the U.S. joining the Paris uh, Peace Accord or Climate Accord. And, and so uh, a lot of the damage done by the four years of the Trump administration can be reversed with, with uh, executive orders. And Congress is not likely to be terribly helpful unless in this upcoming Georgia senatorial election, uh, the Democrats are put in charge. And that in the US system uh, makes a big difference because the committee chairs can move the agenda uh, quite powerfully in, in one direction or stop it, right? And so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see in terms of who ends up in charge of the Senate. But the last four years of the Trump administration have been an ecological nightmare on all of the fronts from And, the, and the, one of the final hour things is he's trying to grant leases, oil, ex, oil and gas extraction leases um, up in the, in the uh, Arctic, in Alaska, in the wildlife refuges, in one of the vast wilderness areas where the caribou herds still roam. Okay. Um... Let me see. Yeah, you already mentioned you don't expect um, too much from the Joe from the from Joe Biden and his administration. But what do you what do you what is your guess? What is maybe the first things they will try to to reverse, or what are their what are their priorities in in, in climate politics? Well, of course they'll they'll join the uh, the Paris Accord, and and uh, um, they I think are actually going to get. Uh, some support from the U.S. auto industry to follow the 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 more strict California air pollution standards that California has been championing, and and so uh, that's good. Uh, in terms of other major initiatives, uh, I think they will they will stop the challenges to the Endangered Species Act and to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and those kinds of things. And they all have climate ramifications. Uh, so um, he has brought in quite seasoned people. Uh, we will see, um, it's a little bit hard to tell right now in terms of energy. There was a real fear that the uh, Secretary of Energy in the US, in the in the Biden administration cabinet would be a pro-nuclear power person, uh, but he has uh, picked a former governor, a woman, um, to be secretary of energy. And I don't know her environmental background very much. Um, of course, there's uh, a major push for renewable energy, uh, but as we'll get into, uh, from my perspective, uh, we also need a a push to radically reduce the amount of energy that, that we use. Uh, typically, uh, Europe uses, uh, the average person in Europe has a dignified life and uses about half as much energy per person as here in the United States. In the state of California, which is the largest state population-wise, um, we mimic the efficiencies of Europe Uh, but the rest of the country doesn't. You know, we're not going to likely see uh, a major push on. Uh, there'll see, be some initiatives around energy efficiency, uh, but not at a scale that's really required to save life on the planet as we know it. Yeah, and talking about all the other, um, yeah, let's say battlefields. I mean, the U.S. society appears to be more divided than it has been for a long time. So. What chances do you see that the Biden administration will be able to to offer solutions and bring bring this society a bit more closer uh, again 
talking about racism, uh, but but also economic crisis, etc. I think we're all we're all learning uh, over the last you know year or two for many of us how much uh, social media and the internet uh, shifts how people receive information and allows people to go into a kind of blinded uh, set of informations that basically support what they generally believe. The algorithms lead us in that direction. This is one of the unintended consequences of the uh, internet and social media technologies, so to speak. And I don't think the Democrats uh, or the Republicans or really anybody that I'm aware of around the world knows how pervasive that is or what to do about it. Uh, there, there's beginning to be a conversation about that. So from that standpoint, you know, I don't think that, that um, the Biden administration is likely to be terribly successful at unifying the country. On the other hand, at least the rhetoric will, will shift. He will, as he has done already, and, th and it's been helpful, he's putting forth, uh, you know, I'm not the president of the Democrats, I'm the president of all the Americans kind of uh, statement, which is not what you got from Donald Trump, of course, right? Yeah. Where he, he encouraged the Proud Boys or the, these sort of anarchistic right-wing militias to uh you know rebel effectively yeah uh, and so uh but also we actually have heard from you know senior officials in the state of texas uh a desire to secede from the united states but many republicans jump down their throat about that and and uh and and said you know because you know they have their own sort of sense of, of patriotism and united we stand and so i don't think that's going to go anywhere yeah all right then i think uh, we move on uh, our idea is um randy to discuss to to first of all discuss a plan that you developed i guess at the foundation earth or in your circles which you call the seven point plan before we go into this plan and before you elaborate a bit on what what this plan uh, consists of in an essay you wrote about this plan, you cite somebody who is very pessimistic in general <laughs> uh, about the, the the steps towards change and that it really that really change might happen or at least in the uh, in the degree that we would need it. What makes you personally more optimistic? Why are you for decades now um, active in this field, or are you still optimistic? <laughs> well, Catherine Ingram is the woman who wrote the essay and she's a journalist who I now lives uh, from the U S but now lives in, uh, Australia. And, uh, she's done her homework. I would not call her pessimistic. I would call her realistic. And this is, you know, kind of a, a tenuous situation that we all have to, uh, uh dance with, so to speak. You know, we want to be realistic and we want to be hopeful, uh, but we don't want to have false optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, I make a distinction between uh, being optimistic and going forth with a good attitude. I'm actually not optimistic that we're going to save life as we know it on planet Earth with a vibrant web of life supporting all species, including uh, us in the United States. So, um, uh, so, that, so I'm not optimistic. And, and uh, I become hopeful mm -hmm. when I, at least on paper, see a realistic plan commensurate with the scale of the problem, right? And the timing of the problem, right? And so um, I believe that one should go forward uh, with a good attitude and enjoy life as you work on consequential issues in a meaningful way, right? Yeah. And I don't have any problem uh, I, I know more than the average American about the, uh, the life support systems of the planet and the damage that's done to the planetary boundaries and uh, the political dynamics, the momentum of the global economy, uh, the, uh, uh, the push for greater degrees of consumption of, of non-renewable resources, the waste and all of that. And uh, you know, if you know the data, 
how can you really be optimistic if mm -hmm. you know the data and the trends, right? Uh, uh, however, um, I also believe that windows of opportunity open up from time to time uh, that allow us to jam through the window um, bold new initiatives, like, for instance, the Green New Deal, right? Or even a better than a Green New Deal, uh, a more deep ecological Green New Deal, right? So uh, we never know quite when those windows are going to open up, and we had better be ready to uh, jam those bold social change and ecological change ideas through when the windows of opportunity open. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, one can be hopeful. Okay. And so, yeah, this, this, this hope and this, this search for these windows of opportunity um, kept you engaged in the last decades, I assume. And you, you continuously talk about the big change in the trajectory that is required. And as far as I understood your, the seven point plan that you suggest is, is one suggestion um, how this, this big trajectory could be changed. Could you uh, explain us a little bit, um, elaborate on what is the essence of this seven-point plan? What do you suggest in this plan? Well, there's sort of three, three points that are precursors to the seven bullet points of the plan, right? And, and that evolved because here in the United States, and I don't know that it's terribly different in in uh, most of the rest of the world. I don't know the particulars in, in Europe, but, but um, here in the United States, the environmental movement uh, quit talking about population issues, population numbers issues, and uh, many years ago. And that in part came right around the time 1985 when I started the Rainforest Action Network. We were organizing in Washington, D.C a uh, citizens conference on the World Bank and tropical rainforests uh, and indigenous peoples. You know, I think it was the first conference that really included indigenous peoples formally into that, where we brought people up from the Amazon to let them speak for themselves about, about these issues. And um, so the US social movement, I don't think, has a winning plan and that's because they are they're not really they're not really well versed in the earth science systems or the biosphere's life support systems and you know they're they're so us us centric and they are so propagandized as many countries are about the the wondrous history uh, of their country and uh, how god is always on their side in in every war so to so to speak um, uh, so at any rate, um, I believe that we need uh, a, a, a rapid simplification of the global economy in terms of energy use and in terms of material throughput, particularly non-renewable resources because of the damage that it does to the uh, planetary boundaries. And I'm sure that many people on the call today are, are familiar with the basics of the planetary boundaries. and the great cycles of the biosphere and what supports life. But that is not the case in the United States. Even in the environmental movement, uh, you know, of course, a subset gets that uh, or studied it in college or has learned it somewhere in the course of their work. Uh, but a whole hell of a lot of uh, activists in, in various environmental groups at, at all levels in the United States are not really familiar with these kinds of things. So um, they don't factor that into their, into their thinking about the solutions. Uh, a whole lot of focus on climate change and 100% renewable energy will save the planet is, is, is how it's often seen over here and how it's characterized even by wonderful people like Bill McKibben, who's a friend of mine at 350.org. Uh, too often conveys to the public. Now, Bill knows better. Bill's written books that show greater de depth, but the message that gets across is, is often uh, uh, somewhat shallow, really, in terms of analysis. Uh, so um, uh, overconsumption reduction, uh, particularly of the billion people at the higher end of the ec economic spectrum around the planet, uh, uh, really don't 
have a right to live the life. It's not responsible to live the life the way they're living it in terms of material consumption, uh, because we don't have a deep green circular economy, right? We don't have that yet. And we still have a linear wasteful economy. And so these three conditions at the front end are essentially, you know, a degrowth of the economy uh, between, uh, in terms of energy use, uh, uh, in terms of the gluttonous energy use, say of, of the U.S. or or a lot of Canadians are pretty similar. Uh, people may have to learn to live on one tenth the amount of energy, but that can be done at a dignified level. You know, I would hazard a guess that in in Europe, one fifth the amount. Of, of current energy may be what people have to drop down to if we're gonna really save the planet. Um, uh, so overconsumption reduction and, and degrowth of the economy, but also numbers reduction. You know, seven or 8 billion people is not okay. Uh, two or if, so how do we humanistically get back down to say two to 3 billion and then reassess uh, how, what level of dignified life can we support for all people uh, right, on this much damaged planet? As people know that have done their homework, uh, this is a nonlinear situation. We don't quite know, uh, given the damage we've done, particularly over the last 200 years of the Industrial Revolution, uh, um, how it's going to affect the perturbations of these great cycles like the jet stream. We already know that the jet stream is getting more wobbly, right? It's going higher up into the Arctic and then deeper down. And that is going to affect agriculture all around the world, right? And so uh, if things go poorly over the next so many decades, uh, it is quite possible that hundreds of millions of people will starve, right? And, and, and um, I think that's a realistic possibility, right? So. Uh, we have got to clamor effectively for bigger and bolder changes right now. And that window of opportunity may be opening up for us. And that leads, those three points lead to the, the seven parts of the seven point plan that I think could get the job done. I prepared a slide with your seven points. Maybe we can have a look at it and you could briefly, so that everybody gets an impression. All right. So given, given that, um, um, if we don't, in my mind, if we don't degrow uh, the overall economy, particularly in terms of non-renewable uh, resources and use less energy and, and uh, reduce overconsumption and uh, humanistically and sensibly reduce our, our overall numbers, um, uh, pardon the expression, but uh, if we don't do that as a precursor to these seven things, I believe we're pissing in the wind we are not going to get the job done, right? And so, um, you know, as is in the essay, happy talk won't save us, you know? And so people out there championing their particular passions, good for them, but what we really need is for people to understand a, a comprehensive holistic plan, okay? And so this is meant to, to be a framework for a more comprehensive plan. And you know, lots of people are doing this. This is just one version, right? So it starts with the promotion of a true cost economy, right? And what is a true cost economy? As many of the people on this call will know, pollution externalities are external to the price, but they are not external to the biosphere, mm -hmm. right? We will go. We will go into more deeply, uh, more deep into this concept as well than later. Yeah. We have yeah, and so I'll say more about that later. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, the second point is, is uh, of course, we need 100% renewable energy, uh, but not 100% of the renewable energy at the level globally that's currently being used, which is still rising, right? It has to make a U-turn down a a as we replace uh, um, you know, fossil fuel energy with renewable energies. The third point is very, very important, and, and in, the, in North America, not often uh, talked about nearly, nearly enough, and that's 100%, a shift to 100% ecological farming, right, and, and a shift in our, in our diets. Uh, uh, when you aggregate the uh, greenhouse gases 
from uh, industrial agriculture globally and the damage to uh, natural environments. It's the primary cause of the damage of, of uh, natural systems. And it's, it's a lot of what leads towards the kinds of release of the viruses that, that we've talked about earlier. The fifth point, it has to do with the shift to low impact lifestyles and ecologically literate citizenry, right? Uh, that's uh, so important. There's a bit of environmental education that's been worked into the US public education system, uh, but it's, it's, it is not uh, um, uh, nearly deep enough in terms of helping people understand how the world works ecologically, right? And, and so um, low impact lifestyles is part of that uh, consumption reduction. These things are all synergistic, of course, with each other. The sixth point is to ensure appropriate technology policy. Um, I don't know how much it's talked about in terms of unintended consequences of technology uh, in Europe, but I can tell you in North America, it's not talked about hardly at all. And yet, uh, arguably, we could essentially say that um, uh, the climate change problem is really the unintended consequence of technology, right? Uh, who thought in the late 1700s when we invented the steam engine and started powering it with coal that it would change the, uh, the chemistry of the atmosphere, the entire planet? Who thought, you know, in the early 1800s when we invented the internal combustion engine and powered it with oil and, uh, and gasoline, that uh, petrol, that it would change the entire atmosphere? Well, of course, a, a one or two scientists, good for them. Uh, but um, the, the climate change problem is really a technology, unintended consequence of technology problem. And the new technologies that are coming up, particularly with genetic engineering and gene splicing and, and nanotechnology, you know, what are the, and, and now we even see with, with the internet technologies and, and social media technologies, unintended consequences. So I would like to see, uh, well, I shouldn't get into that too much right now, uh, but there could be continental centers, think tanks set up around unintended consequences. Uh, the seventh point is my favorite point, frankly, which is simply called other. You know, everything on this list that I didn't uh, talk about that you think is a particularly important part of the solution. Uh, you're not wrong, but a seven point plan can't cover everything. And there are other things and other ways to analyze this, uh, this dilemma. And so uh, that I, uh, when I try to do systems analysis or holistic systems thinking, um, I, I, in my mind, I tend to do it in a pie chart. So if you put these seven points in a pie chart, I, all, I try to always leave a slice of the pie called other, that which I'm not thinking about that I ought to be thinking about, right? And so that's the seven point plan. How is this plan connected with the Green New Deal? Is, is, uh, is there a difference or would this, is this part of the ideas of the Green, Green New Deal, does this seven plan, seven point plan go further? Well, it goes a lot further. Uh, uh, you know, the Green New Deal doesn't really talk about reduction of consumption. The Green New Deal, New Deal plan doesn't talk about reduction of overall energy use. Uh, it does talk about waste reduction in the sense of energy efficiency. Right, but energy efficiency is not really always seen as as um, overall energy reduction. It's just if you have a waste of a wasteful device, make it more efficient so it uses less energy. Uh, but there isn't a overall call for less energy. So, mm -hmm. and the Green New Deal doesn't talk about um, the economic growth model itself, growth for the sake of growth. There's a writer in the United States named Edward Abbey who wrote a, um, a renegade sort of famous novel called The Monkey Wrench Gang, where a bunch of people uh, dismantled, so to speak, a, a big hydroelectric dam on the Colorado River to free the river, right? The Monkey Wrench Gang. And uh, he had a famous statement about uh, growth. He said, growth for the sake of growth 
is the ideology of the cancer cell. So what is the global economy right now? And what is the clarion call of so many of the elected officials, the politicians? Uh, we've got to grow, we've got to grow, we've got to grow the economy, you know, things. And, and they're not talking about a circular economy. And even most of the talk about a circular economy uh, is, is light green, it is not deep green. It doesn't really necessarily sufficiently challenge that overall growth dynamic, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So th th that this is the whole discussion, the important discussion about degrowth. And I personally always ask myself, how will it, how do you think can it be possible to, to convince, especially these high consumerist societies like the US and Europe, uh, or also Australia, the global north, where really this, this impetus of ever, gro ever, uh, ever continuing growth is such an, imp such an important um, principle for for many people and it's so internalized in in in, in our thinking um, what chances do you see that we can convince governments and and countries to to engage in this uh -huh. discussion of degrowth uh -huh. well uh, we have to get i think a little more sophisticated about the discussion at least in my circles over on this continent um, there are people who just haven't thought enough to challenge the idea of linear growth, mm -hmm. right? Including in the environmental movement, including in the Green New Deal, okay? And then there are say ecological progressives who are clamoring for degrowth, right? And, and uh, I, I actually differ with both parts of that fact, of that dynamic in the sense that I believe not in degrowth as the overall goal. I believe in selective growth. Let's select where we need to grow more. Don't we need to grow more in terms of ecological literacy? Don't we need to grow more in terms of renewable energy? Don't we need to grow more in terms of 100% ecological farming, right? So let's have selective growth and grow where we need to grow and degrow where we must degrow or it'll kill us, right? Mm -hmm. So. So my overall policy is not one of degrowth. That's a component of a holistic package. Let's grow where we need to and let's degrow uh, where we need to. Let's, let's increase the uh, ecologically positive trends as we decrease the ecologically negative trends. Mm -hmm. uh, before we open up- uh, oh, but, for... but you ask, you know, how do we convince people of that? Uh, well, you know, if you read the Catherine Ingram essay, you kind of left with a feeling like, well, we can't convince people of that, mm -hmm. right? And again, I don't think she's wrong. On the other hand, I do, as I've mentioned, believe that windows of opportunity open up. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people are not, around the world, are not sufficiently scared at a gut survival level yet. Of course, pockets of them are for various reasons. If you lived in a, in a failed state like Sudan, right, or Somalia, uh, you know, you're scared at a gut survival level, right? And we are going to see more failed states probably in the next couple of decades around the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, hopefully not, but we probably will see more of them. Um, but uh, where people are are generally comfortable in, in a middle class sense, they're not feeling it. I thought 10, 15 years ago, I thought the extreme weather events that we have seen over the last 10 or 15 years would create the context for people to call for a greater degree of change. And that's happened a little bit. I think that's why we're seeing movements like Extinction Rebellion that emerged right out of the UK and is spread as a clarion call, another yet another clarion call uh, for uh, major change commensurate with the scale of the problem, right? But that has, has not turned into a sufficiently popular movement where it's the bulk of humanity calling for that change. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, for the last part of this session, we, um, we would like to go a little bit more deeper into the concept of the true cost economy, Randy. 
Um, you already mentioned the like the basic idea, and it's all about a major shift in in economic rules. But maybe sure. you could explain a little bit, um, yeah, elaborate a bit more on how would such a true cost economy uh, look like, and maybe also how will the role of money change in such an economy? Sure. Um, you know, if I don't talk enough about the role of money, bring me back to that. Uh, but um, is uh, let the phrase a lot. I know that a lot of you at the university have studied uh, economics and have a focus in, in economics and economic systems. Uh, so the phrase internalize externalities, uh, Benjamin, is that terribly well known? I assume for, for most how, of how, the students. How would, you, how would you say that in German? Uh, the in, the in, internalisierten externalitäten, it's almost the same in, as in English. Okay, yeah, all right. But, yeah, um, yeah. but okay. I would say it's the external costs that you that you are that you yeah. are um, calculating yeah. within the calculation of the, the yeah right and so a true cost economy that's not a popular phrase for an alternative economic model uh, here in the united states but it's the one that that i like best i think it, it it's got a, a lot of utility and functionality to it uh, but cost doesn't always doesn't necessarily mean financial cost if something I do cost you your life, that's not a financial concern to you and, and your family and friends, right? And so cost is not only a financial term, but of course economists tend to think with their, with their blinders and, and certainly uh, neoliberal classical economists, you know, out of the Milton Friedman School of Economics, right? But at any rate, so a true cost economy, uh, internalizing externalities, uh, the externalities we're talking about, what's external to the financial price of a commodity, this blue shirt, right? Okay, the manufacturing of this blue shirt, right? Let's say it's cotton. Well, cotton uses the most pesticides of probably any agricultural crop on planet Earth. Cotton is a hideous product from that perspective, right? And so, uh, the pollution from those pesticides that go into the streams and the rivers and the oceans and and the uh, fertilizers from the making of this cotton, uh, those fertilizers that go into the, that run off and go into the, the nitrogen fertilizers and particularly artificially produced from natural gas often, right, that go into the rivers and, and, and the oceans and create the dead zones, right? There are over 400 dead zones around the planet in oceans at the mouth of, of major rivers. Uh, think of the Mississippi River here in the United States that runs into the Gulf of Mexico, right? There's a massive dead zone at the end. And that's because that watershed that drains, that's all of that, that industrial wheat belt, wheat and corn, and, and hideous amounts of, of pesticides and fertilizers running down there and creating a dead zone. And of course, Europe, Europe has the same problem in South America and Africa and, and, and other parts of the, of the planet as well, all right? So those are the pollution externalities, an example of it. And the phrase to internalize those externalities isn't really about internalizing them into the financial costs of the product, it's about eradicating them from the face of the earth. So a true cost economy is really not about internalizing pollution externalities and making necessarily just making this cost more when I buy it. Uh, it's about getting rid of a problem, right? And so how, you know, how do we get rid of a problem? Uh, what are the techniques to internalize an externality? Or what are the techniques to, to change the economic model so that it's more ecologically sound. And, and one of the most important techniques is to get rid of the government subsidies to the troublesome industries like mining and logging and industrial agriculture, oil and gas extraction. They're heavily subsidized by governments around the world, whether you're talking about the Chinese government or the Russian government or the German government or the US government or the Brazilian government. You know, Brazil subsidizes a lot of, say, soybean 
industry. And that's the major cause of the, of the, of the destruction of the southern perimeter of the Amazon is conversion to industrial agriculture for monocultures of soybeans, right? It's a hideous problem. So how do you, how do you build, a true, what is a true cost economy and how do you build a true cost economy? Um, I went through the ecological economics literature and created another document called Techniques to Internalize Externalities which Benjamin, I can send to you and you can share with people if, if they're particularly interested in that. I was yeah. rather shocked that the major, um, um, the famous people here in the United States for ecological economics, uh, I called them up because I know them, they're friends of mine, Herman Daly, the, the father of ecological economics and, and Josh Farley at the University of Vermont and, and Robert Costanza, you know, and all these people. I said, well, uh, don't you have a list of techniques to internalize externalities? And they said, well, gee, no, we kind of know what that is, of course, and we write about it, but there's no coherent list. So I made one myself, right? And I'm not a trained economist, uh, but I think I have a modicum of common sense. And so I'm happy to share that with you. But, and that is one point about the Biden administration that he has said specifically, and we really need to hold his feet to the fire on this in terms of climate change. And, and, and how he will um, be different than the Trump administration. He has specifically talked, and it didn't help him in the election, he has talked about eradicating the uh, perverse subsidies to the oil and gas industry here in the United States. And so uh, that's fine for him to say, but will he do it? In the past, uh, Democrats have not uh, really been very good on that, and Republicans are, are, are not only not good on that, they're the opposite. They want to add more subsidies, right? And so uh, uh, the name Christine Lagarde, Lagarde you know, was, was head of the International Monetary Fund, and now she's got some senior position in Europe in the economy. Uh, she she uh, commissioned a report on subsidies at the IMF, but then they didn't do much about it. And the OECD uh, did a major study some years ago about subsidies, and then they didn't do much about it. But subsidy reduction is one way in which we can have a, a true cost economy. See, in a true cost economy, the cleanest product is financially the cheapest. Think of this in terms of, say, tomatoes. You have a, a, an organic tomato, and you have a slightly toxic industrial tomato, right? Typically at the market right now, which is more expensive? The organic tomato, right? And that's because all of these things that make it uh, um, the, the toxic tomato. And by the way, I think that's the wrong language. We shouldn't be calling this the organic tomato and this the tomato. We should be calling this tomato and slightly toxic tomato. You know, and if, if that's how the labeling worked, you know, and also in terms of, of any other product that you might imagine, right? So our language is, is a little bit screwy, but th that aside for the moment, uh, uh, in a true cost economy, the cleanest is the cheapest. And that's a really important principle to understand. And when the cleanest is ecologically cleanest is the cheapest, we can save the earth. So that's the major change in the current model of the global economy. See, do I think um, high finance industrial capitalism is a good model for a global economy? No, but at least in, in North America, there's no wind in the sail of any coherent economic model. We don't even talk about the light green circular economy over here. I know you do in Europe. Uh, but I don't know that there's that much talk about a deep green circular economy, and there's a difference. One challenges that growth ethic that we talked about earlier. And so um, in the true cost economy, uh, the cleanest is the cheapest, and that's really important. And then, you, and to do that, you've got to internalize those externalities. But remember that what that, that really means is to get rid of the problems, the ecological problems, caused by the economy. And so if, if we do that meaningfully in fossil fuels, 
as a starting point, that's great. That will affect lots of other sectors eventually. But we also need to get rid of those perverse subsidies uh, in uh, you know, uh, the logging industry and industrial agriculture and, and so many other, other sectors of the economy. All right, so um, uh, Benjamin, any follow-up yeah. questions on, on the true cost economy? There's so much you, to talk paper, about. You, you talk about how then also the role of money will change. Maybe just briefly, you can say some words about, uh, about money, debt, what will, what will be the, the effect, and then we open up for questions. Part of what I was, was getting to moments ago is, is that I don't believe a true cost economy, which is essentially ecologizing capitalism, I don't believe personally that that's a good model for the, even if we achieve that, I don't believe necessarily that's the best model for the next thousand years of humanity, right? But, it, but until there's wind in the sail, so to speak, of a coherent alternative model where people know how to feed their family, pay their bills, have enough money to put braces on the children if, if the children need braces and maybe save for college. You know, those are simple, pragmatic things that people want to know how to do. And you can talk about degrowth or anything you want, but if you don't reach regular people with an answer to those simple questions, you're not going to get a lot of, of uh, collaboration, right? Yeah. And so, uh, my putting forth the true cost economy economic model is just to radically reduce the damage we do to the earth, to buy enough time that we don't eradicate our species or, or much of the other species in the web of life, right? So we have a chance to build, to make that paradigm shift, that ecological societal U-turn to a more socially just and ecologically sound world. You know, what that model looks like uh, for the long term of, let's say, a thousand years or 5,000 years, I don't quite know. Uh, but I, I certainly know that if we were to achieve a true cost economy, we might have a fighting chance to save this planet and save our species, right? Uh, and, yeah. and overcome that dilemma that Catherine Ingram talks about in, 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 her, in her essay. So in terms yeah. of, of money per se, um, it doesn't change that much, mm -hmm. right? It's still a market economy. You know, there's still euros and you go down to the corner store to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, nothing in that sense changes mm -hmm. uh, in what I'm putting forth. Yeah, great. In in this paper that we mentioned, you you um, you list twelve principles, and we will not have the time to go into detail here. Well, well, I, let me. I could say another thing though about how do you achieve a true cost economy. I mentioned that there were you know ten techniques. Yeah. And and another one, you know, and one is to get rid of the perverse subsidies that mm -hmm. make it financially viable for people to do bad things environmentally, right? And that's kind of a no-brainer. We understand that. Uh, another one is 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 um, is uh, ecological taxes, uh, green taxes that people have heard about, or if you know the 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 uh, your economics a bit, it, it's called a Pigovian tax. Uh, Pigot was a person actually with a French name, but in the UK, and it's also called a sin tax, like sinning in the religious sense, and so. It's talked about in terms of say tobacco and alcohol. Let's put a sin tax on tobacco and alcohol because they have problematic aspects to our society and make it more expensive and then there'll be less of it. Okay, well, uh, tax reform in that sense, there's a role for that. And so um, uh, uh, a Pagovian tax or a sin tax can be put on a lot of, 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 of uh, problematic goods and services. So in the sense of say this example of a shirt, right? If you had one version of this shirt uh, that was made with a lot of toxic chemicals and another version of this shirt that was organic and, and uh, not, um, it may be financially more expensive 
to do that cotton agriculture and make this shirt, uh, but you could put an escalating tax over time uh, that that uh, mean that eventually would get you to the point where the the organic shirt was cheaper than the toxic shirt, right? And people like a bargain. Everybody likes a bargain. Even uh, Bill Gates from Microsoft and Jeff Bezos from Amazon, they know probably like a bargain. Uh, but uh, so hence getting back to that principle of when the cleanest, ecologically cleanest is the cheapest, we can save the planet. So again, that being um, a major aspect of a true cost economy. Maybe we can close with a, with a not so academic question, so to say. <laughs> Uh, we started this session by by um, by introducing you, saying you you, you started your your uh, life of activism in somewhere in the 80s, I guess, or even earlier. The the, right. the Rainforest right. Fund uh, network was founded there. From all your experience uh, in these decades, and from sure. what you know about the the social movements and the climate movements, etc., what is what would be your message? Uh, to young people, younger activists, younger academics who engage in these discussions today. What do you have a, a message or a perspective or anything that is very key or important for you personally? Even before I started Rainforest Action Network, I was at that time 35, it was 1985. Um, uh, when I graduated from college uh, uh, with uh, my best buddy in my hippie van, we drove from West Virginia and Ohio and, and Western Pennsylvania. Uh, we drove across the country to California uh, to seek our fortune <laughs> at, in terms of um, the beatniks, the beatniks of the 1950s. Uh, they had a really interesting perspective and a different worldview, right? And so, uh, one of the famous uh, beatnik poets was Gary Snyder, a nature poet named Gary Snyder, who lived in Northern California. And he had been invited to my university. And, and he talked about indigenous peoples and he talked about the natural world. He had gone to and lived in Japan and studied Zen and got outside of the milieu of Eurocentric industrial um, uh, worldview and had a real experience, right? And so um, I was so impressed with that, you know, at, at the age when I was in undergraduate school, just graduating, uh, that I wanted to drive my hippie van uh, across, across the country and relocate and hang out with the remnants of, of those people and those kinds of thinkers, which have inspired a lot of the good developments that you actually hear about in the state of California, where it's more uh, socially and ecologically progressive than the rest of, of the United States, right? But my great grandmother was a Blackfoot Indian. You know, I'm from West Virginia, uh, but Northern West Virginia near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for people who kind of know that geography. And, and I didn't grow up as an American Indian, but I've got a bit of blood in me, so to speak. And, uh, and so I was curious about American Indians uh, way back when. And, and circumstantially, in night, when I graduated from college, right, uh, uh, and I figured out my senior year that it was, it was nature and environment and ecology that was my calling. You know, my actual degree was in psychology and sociology, uh, but I, you know, it was the sign of the times when I graduated, you know, the end of the Vietnam War, the birth of the environmental movement, uh, or at least a new phase of it, and Earth Day in the United States and, and such. But I ended up living off and on for 10 years from 1973 to 1983 with the Hopi Indian tribe near the Grand Canyon out in the deserts, just north of the Painted Desert and just east of the Grand Canyon uh, on what's called the Colorado Plateau. Uh, there's the Navajo tribe, the Diné people that many of you will have heard of. But I know that in Germany, there's a lot of awareness of the Hopi tribe. It's the oldest tribe in North America, as far as we know. And most of the other Indian tribes uh, adhere to that kind of thinking. Well, the, the elders, the 100-year-old, the wise 100-plus-year-old 
women and men of the Hopi elders, I became a kind of secretary and chauffeur, an assistant. I was not an understudy of their shamanistic philosophy per se, but I spent, um, I didn't just visit as a tourist. I lived off and on for several months every year over an entire decade and I stayed in touch with them. So what I'm saying to the youth is, um, you know, if you can go down to Ecuador or Peru into the sacred headwaters, you know, there are programs to help you do that. In other words, get outside of the milieu as much as you can of, indus of the industrial mindset, hang out with peoples who haven't been so totally infected by it and have that experience because that was my real graduate school training. My 10 years as secretary and chauffeur to the Hopi elders was where I really learned about a deep ecological thinking and the long-term time perspective over thousands of years. I used to ask a simple question to the elders and they would talk for 20 minutes and I'd wonder what the heck they were talking about that had to do with my question. And yet they would go back in time because they have an oral tradition that goes back in time. I can tell you what happened 500 years ago because they told me, right? What happened when the Spanish conquistadors marched from Mexico up into like what's now Arizona and up towards the Grand Canyon and the Hopis who knew that they were coming because the indigenous peoples had those kind of networks. Uh, they went down 500 years to go to meet with them you know, what happened? Well, they still have the oral tradition. They know those things, right? And they look to see what was the symbol of their society. Because the Hopi's symbol is a circle with a cross inside the circle. And the circle can represents in part the great cycles of the planet, a holistic perspective. And the cross inside of it is not just the four directions. It's also the ability to divide and rearrange, i.e. technology. But if your technology policy is inside uh, the great cycles, if it's inside the circle, then that's okay. They saw a cross with no circle. And what the Hopis meant or thought that meant was these people may have lost sight of the holism of nature. Mm -hmm. All right, we may be in for a dark period. And I'll conclude, because I know we're coming up on the end of this, uh, by saying there's a petroglyph down there, you know, and, and it's got three world wars on it. And, but between the second and the third one, there's a window of opportunity to create a different approach to living on this planet. And it goes off on the petroglyph in healthy corn plants. So we have a possibility to save the day if we all can keep that holistic perspective. And that's my advice to the youth, develop that holistic perspective.